The presidential candidates are making one more push through California on this last weekend before the state primary. One will make a stop here in San Diego. San Diego's transit system is about to upgrade the way riders pay their fares, moving away from cash only. We actually got to make a tangible difference this time. And art students and alum rejoice as a beloved UC San Diego institution gets a reprieve. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amitha Sharma. We're heading into the last weekend before Election Day, and the presidential candidates are sweeping through California. Democrat Bernie Sanders is expected here in San Diego on Sunday. He's holding a rally at Qualcomm Stadium. Some Sanders supporters are digging in, saying they won't support Hillary Clinton should she clinch the Democratic nomination for president. AP reporter Haven Daly says both candidates are still campaigning hard ahead of next week's primary. It's a fight to the finish, the last big contest in the Democratic primary, with hundreds of delegates in play. Even with the math to clinch the nomination against him, Sanders has been barnstorming California. We're going to go marching in to the Democratic convention with incredible momentum. With recent polls showing a tighter than expected race, Hillary Clinton is hoping to avoid an embarrassing loss, ramping up her campaigning in the state. This primary on June the 7th needs to send a real signal that Donald Trump will hear no matter where he is that California wants a positive future. Clinton needs around 70 delegates Tuesday to clinch the Democratic nomination, a victory within reach. Are you planning to vote on Tuesday, June 7th? She'll be our next president. I'm actually going to go to Washington, D.C. for the inauguration. Sanders supporters say he's already won a major victory by moving the Clinton campaign to the left on economic issues. But for some, that's not enough. Even if he's not running as a third party, I'll still write him in. Um, I don't have any faith in Hillary. These supporters say they won't accept a Clinton nomination. They expect Bernie support, Bernie's supporters to abandon their values and vote for Hillary along party lines. And that's, that's offensive. Fueling their anger, what they feel was a fixed primary process. Sanders even calling the superdelegate system absurd. I'm to the point where I feel that Americans need to wake up. And if, it needs, if, if that means four years of Trump in the White House, in order for Americans to actually wake up and engage in the democratic process, then that might be something I'm willing to live through. Meanwhile, Clinton supporters working to get out the California vote say they remain confident that the party will unite at the Democratic convention. In 08, it was the same. You know, many Hillary or uh, Obama folks uh, at one point said, you know, I, I won't support the other side, and, and they came together. Uh, so I definitely i am very confident that we will unite, and we want to keep the White House blue. Political experts say the Democrats will need Sanders' support in November's general election. And she will need those voters, and she'll need him to go out and campaign enthusiastically uh, for her. Because a lot of these people are, are young people, and a lot of these people are not really Democrats, really. Many of them are independents. A few months ago, it was the Republicans who were expected to have a contested convention. Now it's the Democrats who may have to work harder to unite the party when they gather next month in Philadelphia. Haven Daily, Associated Press, San Jose, California. A group of protesters attacked Donald Trump's supporters who were leaving the presidential candidate's rally in San Jose on Thursday night. A dozen or more people were punched. At least one person was pelted with an egg. And Trump hats grabbed from supporters were set on fire on the ground. There were no immediate reports of injuries. At least four people were taken into custody.
Outsiders running for office hope to appeal to voters who are fed up with politics as usual. And that's not just here in the U.S., but also across the border in Mexico. That country holds midterm elections on Sunday. From our Fronteras desk, Angela Cocherga shows us candidates who've never held elected office are running for mayor in key border cities, including Tijuana. <laughs> Spend a little time with candidate Ramon Cantu as he goes door to door in Nuevo Laredo. And it's clear, voters are frustrated with the two major political parties. Cantu shares that feeling. It's why he resigned from his job as publisher of the local newspaper to run for mayor as an independent candidate. I'm, I'm a citizen. I'm not a, polit a politician. I'm a, I've been uh, working hard for Nuevo Laredo. A mostly volunteer staff is now working for what he calls his 100% citizen campaign. Canto is up against eight rivals, including some who have the backing of well-organized political parties that get the lion's share of federal campaign funding. He appeals to voters like this woman who are disgusted with politics as usual. She asks, what have the PRI or PAN parties done except make promises? Queremos poner el ejemplo. We want to put the example, the good example, so we can start building a, again our city with new hope. Nuevo Laredo is trying to recover after years of brutal drug violence. So is Tijuana, a border city where another outsider is running for mayor. Sí, soy la alternativa. Julian Lesayola says he's the alternative for voters who do not want traditional party candidates. He's a familiar face in Tijuana, although he's never held elected office. He was the police chief of this city during some of its most violent years. When I left Tijuana for Ciudad Juarez, there were no longer dismembered bodies, and kidnappings were virtually zero. Lesayola says he survived nine attempts on his life the most recent in Ciudad Juarez, where he also served as police chief. A year ago, a bullet left him in a wheelchair, paralyzed from the waist down. Somos las piernas de Isaola. Now supporters call themselves his legs on the campaign trail, where he faces 10 rivals. Les Ayola is the mayoral candidate for a small political party. Una cosa es ser un partido it's pequeño, one thing to represent es a small party. Pequeño. It's another to feel small. Yo no me siento pequeño. I do not feel small. He wants to promote growth, investment, and tourism in Tijuana and vows to weed out corruption. Les Ayola is spreading that law and order message mostly on social media since he does not have money for slick campaign ads. While many credit Tijuana's former top cop for reducing violent crime, others criticize him for human rights abuses. His biggest challenge could be voter apathy. Last summer, nearly 70 percent of voters did not show up on Election Day. This young mother has not decided on a candidate or at this point whether she'll vote at all. Here on the campaign trail, candidates who are outsiders appeal to voters who are fed up with politics as usual. But there is a risk. Some people are so turned off by the process they may not turn out on Election Day. In Nuevo Laredo, Cantu understands why many voters tell him security is their top issue. A few years ago, a grenade tossed into his newspaper's building paralyzed a reporter. Years earlier, an editor was killed. The paper now self-censors to avoid being targeted again. Even so, he downplays the risks of running for mayor. If I'm an honest mayor, they don't have to be, I mean, I'm not in risk. Cantu says corrupt officials who cut deals with cartels run into problems. Hacer pactos con la gente de bien, con la sociedad. He says he does want to make a pact, but with the good people of Nuevo Laredo. June 5th, voters in Mexico decide whether they're willing to support independent candidates and outsiders or stick with traditional party candidates. Ramón Cantu, candidato independiente a la alcaldía de Nuevo Laredo. In Nuevo Laredo, Angela Cocherga.
San Diego's Metropolitan Transit System has come under fire recently for having an outdated system for paying fares. But KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says part of that system is getting a big upgrade. Say you want to take the bus in San Diego. Right now, the only way to pay for a single ride is in cash. That's expected to change in November when MTS aims to add a long-awaited function to the Compass Card, Stored Value. The function allows you to load cash on the fare card and keep it like a virtual wallet. MTS says more flexibility with paying fares makes riding easier, and that can increase ridership. It's been stated that people out there would ride more often if they had that greater flexibility. So, um, yeah, getting choice riders out of their cars and into transit is another of our goals. This comes after months of pressure from some MTS board members and transit advocates. Colin Parent, policy counsel for the advocacy group Circulate San Diego, says the news is encouraging. Having stored value is just going to expand the types of ways that people are able to pay to ride transit. And it's just a great example of how a public agency like MTS can make a, a meaningful improvement for the lives of transit riders. MTS is also planning a new smartphone app that will sell all kinds of tickets. That's expected to go live toward the end of summer. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. The state assembly approved legislation today that would allow lawmakers to restructure the public utility system with a constitutional amendment. Backers say recent disasters like the Aliso Canyon leak and the San Bruno gas line explosion could have been avoided if the state's public utilities were better managed and weren't stretched so thin. The California Public Utilities Commission has jurisdiction over everything from Ubers and Lyfts to hot air balloons to limousines to moving companies to electric utilities and gas pipelines. It's too much. I think they need to be more focused and more specialized. The proposed bill would put an initiative on the November ballot so voters can decide if they want the change. The legislation now heads to the Senate for debate. Another proposed bill may drastically change where people can buy tobacco products. The legislation intends to prevent the sale of tobacco products at convenience and grocery stores. Only businesses who generate 60% of their revenue from tobacco sales would be allowed tobacco licenses. These are mostly 18 and over cigar shops. The measure has moved forward in the state Senate. The concern that we have is the, is the advertisement and the, and the exposure that youth have in the Vons, in the Safeways, in the, in the uh, Rite Aids, in the, in to, the stores. So, so I understand that your concern that there will be some increase in tobacco-only stores, but those stores are only to allow, given the, the California law, 21-year-olds to go in there. Critics of this legislation fear that the presence of tobacco-only stores will grow and that low-income communities will see the most impact. San Diego janitors who work in biotech companies rallied in front of Illumina today. Members of SEIU United Service Workers West are protesting low wages, lack of health care coverage, and what they consider dangerous working conditions. Our janitors cleaned this big biotech, and the mayor gave them a big tax cut. And we don't have that forgiveness. We need health care for our members. All San Diego janitors need to be respected. Illumina issued a statement saying they outsource janitorial services, so they do not directly employ staff, but they do require their vendors to comply with all applicable law. It may be time to roll out that swimsuit. Steph Davis says the weekend will remain warm and sunny in San Diego. That's tonight on the KPBS Weather Report. Happy Friday, everyone. We have a warm and dry weekend ahead all across our area. Satellite and radar showing dry conditions across much of the west with a strong ridge of high pressure in control of the weather pattern. And you'll notice mainly clear skies as well. That's also what we see closer to home. Nothing really going on here on satellite and radar, though we will see temperatures really continue to climb as we roll throughout the next couple of days. Mild and 
Borrego Springs tonight and clear. Your overnight low is 71 degrees. Temperatures in Mount Laguna will fall back to 55. Mid 50s for Ramona under mainly clear skies. 62 tonight in Alpine. Cooler along the ocean here in Oceanside around 58 for your overnight low. 64 is the low in San Diego itself. Temperatures really going to climb all across the western half of the country throughout the weekend and into early next week. This heat will really expand. It's going to be the hottest week so far this season, mainly dry, and that will lead to the increase for fire danger. So please do exercise caution. Probably want to hold off on any of those control burns. Now across our area, the National Weather Service has issued a heat advisory for the San, San, Diego, Valley, San Diego County valleys and also the inland areas. And we also have an excessive heat warning in effect for the desert region. So please do be careful out there. Make sure to keep yourself nice and hydrated. Cooler as per usual along the coast with that nice sea breeze. So fog lifting for sunshine on Saturday. Your high is 78, 75 for your Sunday. So it should be a beautiful weekend down at the water. 72 with sunny skies Monday will relate, remain in the low 70s Tuesday and Wednesday. Five day outlook inland temperatures press 80 for your Saturday mid 70s Sunday and into Monday. Fog will break for sunshine Tuesday and we'll see clouds and sunshine and a high of 74 degrees for inland on Wednesday. Temperatures climbing across the mountains 87 on Saturday, 84 on Sunday, warm and dry. Temperatures will be much more comfortable Monday and Tuesday with highs in the low 80s, partly sunny and 84 on Wednesday. Again, we do have that excessive heat warning in effect for the deserts and you can see why temperatures breaking to one 12 for your Saturday, 109 Sunday, and will remain in the triple digits as we look ahead to early next week. Steph Davis, KPBS News. The 18th annual Suja Rock and Roll San Diego Marathon and Half Marathon gets underway this weekend. The two-day event is unique because of the live music featured at the end of each mile. A record 33,000 runners from all 50 states are registered to run. Celebrated San Diego runner Meb Keflazigi will be there. He is the only person to ever win an Olympic medal and the Boston and New York marathons. When I ran and started running, I was in seventh grade PE class at Roosevelt Junior High by the zoo, San Diego Zoo, and uh, I wanted to get an A, I wanted to get a t-shirt, and my God-given talent was discovered. I ran a 520 mile, which got me the A and a t-shirt, and the rest is history because I got better and better. I went to UCLA, graduated from UCLA, and won four NCAA title, and then yeah, that's, I'm like, oh, maybe I could do this as a profession. Yeah, Organizers say they're prepared for this weekend's record heat. Most of the marathon is along the coast. Extra water and ice cooling buses and misting stations will be available along the route. This year's new finish line is at Waterfront Park downtown. Trump berates the judge in the Trump University lawsuit and Clinton unloads in a San Diego speech. Who's got the edge among the five candidates for San Diego City Attorney? Of the five city council races, only one may be a game changer. And will Proposition H really fix San Diego's infrastructure problems? It's all politics ahead of Tuesday's primary on the Roundtable tonight at 8.30 here on KPBS. Protests turned into celebrations Thursday night as school officials backed away from their decision to permanently close the UC San Diego University art gallery known as UAG. Protests against the closure of the 50-year-old gallery have been staged there since late May, but an afternoon but an afternoon campus notice stated that with the support of Chancellor Kozla, we have removed the UAG from consideration for redevelopment at this time. How often do you, do you ever get to co uh, be a part of any form of activism that's successful? But we actually got to make a tangible difference this time. For the moment, the gallery remains open, but its future still remains uncertain. First Folio, the book that gave us Shakespeare, is on tour from the Folger Library. San Diego is the only stop in California thanks to a collaboration between the Old Globe and the San Diego Public Library. KPBS arts reporter Beth Accomando gets a sneak peek of the exhibit before it opens to the public on Saturday. Costumes and memorabilia from 80 years of the Old Globe Theater producing the Bard on stage makes walking through the San Diego Public Library Gallery like taking a journey through time. 
This is a subtle whore. Resolve you for more amazement. As I am man, my state is desperate for my master's love. Until you've traveled back 400 years to find the book that gave us Shakespeare. To bear or not to bear, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a say of troubles and by opposing, end them. That's how Hamlet would have sounded in Shakespeare's day. But we might have never known some of Shakespeare's eloquent lines if his plays had not been collected 400 years ago in what's known as the first folio, says library director Misty Jones. After Shakespeare's death, you know, some friends and colleagues of his took the plays and published them. And without them doing that, without them publishing and putting these, um, these plays together into folios, we would not have Hamlet. We would have no access to Macbeth. Having the first folio here is amazing. Knowing what we went through to make this happen um, makes it all the more special. Shakespeare is kind of the ultimate librarian's dream, right? To have a Shakespeare text in your building. It's definitely a part of our history. We need to preserve object history and how people are able to learn from it. It's a way to make history, literature, poetry, theater tangible um, in its object form. It really is about the book. As an object, it's fascinating. The printing history of it tells a lot about how expensive paper was at the time. There are mistakes on the pages that they wouldn't have fixed because the paper was so expensive that they would print like that. We have these large panels where you get to see his words, his, the text, the, the type laid out. Uh, it really, I think, will remind people that, that this technology of printing in the 17th century, this was quite an accomplishment to put this book together. And the play that it's been open to is Hamlet. Right before you reach the first folio, we have Hamlet and Claudius and Gertrude. My words fly up, my thoughts remain below. Alas, poor Yorick. I knew him, Horatio. And when you finally arrive at the first folio, you'll find these famous words. To be or not to be. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing any. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether or not they even know that it's from Hamlet, or whether or not they even know that it's Shakespeare, it's um, a, a way that, that people can realize that they know Shakespeare. And we've discovered over the course of this research all the different ways people know Shakespeare and may not know it. Like The Lion King is Hamlet. But it's, it's those, those references to Shakespeare that we're hoping that people will realize how accessible he is even now, even 400 years later. Alas, poor stormtrooper, I knew ye not. In the children's library, we're going to have a wonderful display of the Star Wars Shakespeare series of books where the illustrations are really going to kind of come to life. Nay, nay, thou overladen glob of grease, thou imp, thou rubbish bucket fit for scrap, thou blue and silver pile of panther dung. So you're really going to see from high culture to pop culture. Proving that even 400 years after his death, the force is still strong in this one. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. Video journalist Katie Shulev helped produce that story. Hot summer weather helped spark a couple of fires burning near Pala today. Cal Fire just issued new evacuation orders in response. The San Diego County Emergency app pushed this alert to smartphone users less than 20 minutes ago. Firefighters say up to 100 structures are threatened. The fire is moving towards Rancho Heights, a temporary evacuation point, was set up at Great Oaks High in Temecula. 79-year-old Chinto Mendoza is one of Baja California's most storied jazz musicians. He's so revered, the state organizes an annual jazz festival in his name. From our Fronteras partner, Cronkite News, photojournalist Cameron Neely gives us a look at an example of how music knows no borders. We were working to 
always together with the music. The music of the United States and Mexican music is resembles, seems, seems to be the same, same thing. Arizona style, uh, country music, uh, Mexico, ranch, rancho music, <laughs> the polkas, and everything, it's almost the same. Rhythm is, is universal. Uh, you can listen to uh, a melody that, that you like, and you say, oh, I like that, but that, that I got much rhythm, but it's the same music. I like the way it is. Why? Because you feel it, and you like it. can make the people feel good, or dance, or applause, and everything about it. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend.